Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today I'm back at Duelist Den, and uh, I'd like to talk to you all about a subject that I think quite a few people are interested in, and that subject is cap and ball revolvers for self-defense. But what I'd like to talk about is an alternative to cap and ball revolvers for self-defense. So let's take a look at it. I realize that in the land of YouTube, there are two kinds of people. There are those who want all the details, and there are those who want it short and sweet. So if you're a short and sweetie, uh, I'm going to give you the answer from the back of the book right now. Um, and if you're an all the details person, you can keep watching the video and find out why I recommend that. But basically, I recommend that rather than cap and ball revolvers for self-defense, you get yourself an antique cartridge firing double action revolver. These were very prevalent at the end of the 19th century and they're very well made. You could find junky ones, but there are a lot of good ones out there. They don't cost a great deal and they give you all the advantages of a double action cartridge firing revolver. But if it's made before 1899, uh, it's not considered a firearm under federal firearms laws. You don't need to go to an FFL. It can be shipped right to your home, and you can maintain your privacy. So if you want to see why I recommend that in detail, follow on. You know, one of the most common questions that I get, and, and have for years, is what revolver should I... what cut? You know, one of the most common questions that I get, and, and have gotten for years, is what cap and ball revolver should I buy for self-defense? And, uh, you know, for a long time, my answer was very standard. I would answer, none of them. There are better modern alternatives. And I, I realized, after talking to quite a few people about this, that that really was not a fair answer. And, and we'll get into that. There are people who, for a variety of reasons, either can't or won't uh, buy a modern handgun for self-defense. And there's no point in telling them that what they are limited to is a bad choice because they are limited to it. So instead, it's time to embrace it and help them out with that. And, and that's what I did. So. A few years ago, I guess about two years ago, I did a video addressing that subject, which cap and ball revolver is best for self-defense. And I limited myself to cap and ball revolvers that were loaded as cap and ball revolvers. I didn't talk about cartridge conversion cylinders in, in that video because I thought, well, what was the point? I mean, a cartridge conversion cylinder makes it a modern gun. Uh, but I'll talk about that this time. Anyway, that video was very well received. It's had over a hundred thousand views. So obviously there are people who are interested in that subject. Uh, but one criticism I, I have gotten from it is people have said, Mike, you're just teaching felons how to arm themselves and making them dangerous to the rest of us. Uh, you know, I, I want to address that right up front. Well, in my opinion, there are three types of people who are seriously interested in the question of cap and ball revolvers for self-defense. The first group of people are either dedicated history buffs or some other form of anti-technology person, and they do not want to go beyond the technology of the 19th century and their view is if it was good enough for Wild Bill Hickok it's good enough for me if it killed uh, you know, 200,000 people in the Civil War well it'll do the job today and you know you honestly can't argue with that uh, though, though I would posit that if I needed a combat rifle today I would not pick up an 1856 Enfield. I would 
pick up an AR-15 or an AR-10, <laughs> or in my case, a Set Me 308. Uh, but you know, for one shot, that Enfield is as good today as it ever was. So, okay. Uh, but but I get it, and you're right. If it was good enough for Wild Bill Hickok, I'm honestly not going to complain. If that's what you want to do. As long as you train with it, and you get so that you're competent with it, you're handicapping yourself, but, you know, it'll do the job if you can do the job. So that's class number one. The second group of people who are interested in this question are people who could legally buy any modern handgun that they want, but they do not want the government putting their nose in their private business. So they're interested in cap and ball revolvers because they are off the federal radar. And that's the way those people want it. And and that is what it is and, and to be honest with you I completely respect that. So that's that's the second group of people. The third group of people are previously convicted felons or people who belong to some other prohibited class who are not allowed to buy firearms uh, through a federal firearms dealer. And those are the people that, that I am accused of arming. Uh, and I understand your concern if you're concerned about that. So let me tell you how I perceive this. If you are a career criminal or a habitual predator the gun laws make no difference to you and you're not asking me about cap and ball revolvers so you can go out and commit a crime spree uh, people who are habitual felons or who are hardcore predators are going to buy a gun on the black market they'll get a Glock or whatever else they want out of the back of somebody's trunk, they'll buy a stolen gun, or they'll steal a gun. Uh, they're not asking me how to arm themselves with cap and ball revolvers. Frankly, they would laugh at that suggestion. So my advice is not going to them. If you're worried about them, and you should be, well, keep worrying because they're going to have all the firepower they want. Now, the people who are asking me that question are people who are trying to live their lives in accordance with the law. They made a mistake at some point in their lives, maybe a youthful indiscretion, maybe later in life. They paid their time. They are trying to live a clean life. And yet, they do not want to be at the mercy of those predators that we're talking about. And I don't blame them at all for that. Uh, I don't think that you give up your right to self-defense because you committed a crime in, in the past and paid the price for it. I just don't see that. Uh, you never have a right to commit violence against me if I am peaceably living my life or to take what's mine. But that's not what those people want to do. What they want to do is protect their own lives and protect what's theirs, but they can't do that with modern firearms because in America our firearms laws prohibit them from owning modern firearms. Uh, but you know, even going back to Roman law, the right to self-defense is recognized as a basic human right, perhaps the most basic, and, and it's hardwired into our DNA. Right? We will defend ourselves, we will preserve our lives, and people have the right to do that. So if my advice helps them to do that in a legal manner, then I'm all for it. And criticize me if you want. Uh, honestly, it's not going to change my opinion. So in my previous video, I answered the question, what cap and ball revolver is best for self-defense? And you can disagree with my conclusions. I mean, ultimately, any gun is better than no gun. And most stops are psychological stops, meaning most people who are not high on PCP 
or full of hate uh, will stop when they're hit with a bullet because they don't want to get hit with bullets. And, and therefore, even a small caliber gun can be effective. Now, if you are loaded up with PCP, or if you are a person who's mean as a snake, tough as old shoe leather, I'll tell you, you got to hit them with Thor's hammer. Uh, but that's the same with a modern gun, too. So, enough said. Okay, so I, I tried to answer the question what cap and ball revolver is best for self defense? But I have to be honest with you. The more I have thought about it, the more I realize that that is the wrong question. The real question is, what is the most effective handgun that I can legally acquire for self-defense without going through government regulations? Because that's what the real question is. I mean, for people who are asking me that question, it's not because they want to use an 1860 uh, Colt Army or a Remington New Model Army revolver to defend themselves. It's because they can get that gun without going through a federal firearms license and all the requirements that that entails on their past history. Okay, so what if there's a better choice than that where you still don't have to go through the whole federal firearms license regulations? And I think there is. So let's talk about that. But before we do, I want to caveat this whole discussion by saying what I'm going to say only applies to United States of America federal firearms laws. If you live in a different country, then you're quite aware that your firearms laws are different than the United States of America. And, and you've got to know what's allowable on yours. <laughs> it's not going to do you any good if, uh, you know, your local gendarmerie kicks down your door and arrests you and you say, but Monsieur Mike Bellevue said this was fine. <laughs> They're going to say, get in the hooskow, buddy. Right? So no good. So it, it applies to the United States. And as I said, it applies to federal firearms laws. What a lot of people don't seem to realize when they ask that question about cap and ball is that all sins are not forgiven because it's okay under federal firearms laws. Uh, most laws that you're going to run into on firearms are actually state and local laws. And they can be quite different from federal laws and they can be more restrictive. Okay. Uh, because states and local governments have a lot of say in how firearms laws are implemented. And a lot of people say that that's wrong. Oh my God, you know, New York State, <laughs> which is awful for this stuff, shouldn't be allowed to be awful for it uh, compared to, say, Utah, which is, you know, quite easy. Okay. Well, the fact is the states are... Uh, centers for experimentation, right? They have states' rights, and people get to vote with their feet. Uh, and I know that's not as easily done as it is said, but the fact is states are allowed to make up more restrictive firearms laws. Uh, should they be able to? Lots of times they make them in contravention of their own constitutions, so probably probably they're doing the wrong thing there. But the fact is they have a lot of leeway on that. And the Supreme Court has laid down some caveats that they cannot go beyond. And I think there should be more of those. Uh, but there are always going to be some state and local regulations. And not all of those recognize uh, muzzle-loading firearms or replicas of muzzle-loading and cap and ball firearms as an excluded class from their general firearms laws. Some do and some don't. Now, Pennsylvania, it happens it does, which is a good thing. Uh, a very good thing. But in most places, you're going to find that anything that fires a gas-propelled um, object, you know, a ball, a bullet, whatever, 
is going to be classified under firearms for the purpose of carrying. Now it's not the same everywhere, obviously. You gotta you gotta see what your state allows. But my point is, uh, don't take what I'm telling you here to the bank for your locale. You've got to see whether or not there are some uh, quirks in that, in terms of your state or your locality. Should you happen to live in New York or Illinois, in New York City, in Chicago? Oh my God, uh, California, Maryland. Massachusetts, I mean, Hawaii, uh, there are lots of states that are more restrictive than the Soviet Union for, for getting some guns. So, uh, and the Soviet Union doesn't exist anymore. Um, but you get my point, right? So make sure you learn those laws. So that said, let's get into that question of what is the most effective gun that you can buy without going through federal regulations. Well, one way of approaching this, and this is a way that a lot of people pointed out in my last video, which is quite true, is that you can buy a black powder cap and ball firearm legally, and you can legally buy a cartridge conversion cylinder to put on it and you can fire modern cartridges out of that gun legally and that's absolutely true absolutely true buy them separately uh, and you have no problem with federal firearms regulations at all so if you get a Remington New Model Army which is the easiest to use uh, or you get a Colt 1860 they're both uh, take 45 Colt uh, replacement cylinders cartridge conversion cylinders that gives you all the power you could want. Uh, they, they're they an excellent choice. The price for all of that will run you in around the $600, $700 range. But it's about the easiest way to go. Then you can get the black powder gun first, save up your money, get the conversion cylinder. Uh, now there are some downsides to it. The 45 Colt cylinders generally work fine as is with the gun, and you can shoot any lead 45 Colt ammunition through it. Don't shoot jacketed stuff, don't shoot plus P, but if you shoot standard velocity 45 Colt, you can shoot smokeless ammo, uh, factory ammo, get cowboy loads or Winchester white box or standard Remingtons, you will be just fine. You get Black Hills um, 45 Colt absolutely just fine um, whether or not the guns will stand up in the long term to those smokeless loads I gotta tell you that's a little bit of a question uh, I've had I've had guns that pieces fell off of because that smokeless pressure and recoil is much sharper than the black powder the cylinders designed for it but the guns are not the guns are much softer steel uh, but for what you want to do they will probably work just fine now the 38 caliber versions, you know, like the Colt Navies, Pocket Navies, uh, Remington Navy, not so good because if you buy factory ammunition and you're shooting a 357, 0.357 inch bullet through a 0.375 inch bore and they will do quite badly and it doesn't take much range at all before they're doing very badly, very inaccurate. Uh, you can correct that if you use hollow base wide cutters because the base will expand to fill the bigger bore and they shoot quite well uh, but you're really limiting yourself for self-defense ammo to that uh, unless you're going to reload hollow base wide cutters uh, or you're going to shoot 38 long colt that has a hollow base and not all of them that are produced today do. Uh, but you can do that. But we still have generally pretty big guns. Those full-size Colt and Remington's quite huge. Uh, that can be mitigated if you're handy. Uh, for instance, I've made the Remington Bulldog. I have made Colt Snubnose revolvers. Uh, they are quite concealable. So, you know, you can do that. You can have a, a much handier gun. Uh, if you do that, but you've got to be 
either handy enough to do it, uh, or you can buy one of the Colt snub nose that Piet is making and put a cylinder on it. But you're still dealing with 45 Colt recoil, and not everybody can handle that. Uh, so if you're smaller, if you're recoil averse, if you're getting older, uh, I mean, I'm 67, I still shoot them pretty good, but I, I do notice that I notice the recoil more now than I did when I was a young man of 60. So that's a solution that works, but it might not be the best solution. So what do I think is a better solution? Well, a lot of people don't realize that under federal law, firearms manufactured prior to 1899 are considered antiques and they are not subject to federal firearms regulations. Uh, they are exactly like cap and ball revolvers. In fact, the law that established that happens to be the same law that allows cap and ball revolvers to go through that loophole. So there are a lot of guns made prior to 1899 that are much more suitable for self-defense than cap and ball revolvers and I would recommend you take a look at those. Now a lot of people think when they think you know prior to 1899 they think that it's got to be a Colt single action army revolver. Okay I want to wait for a plane to go over us. Sometimes I don't catch them and then I hear it when it's being edited and it's just terrible. Uh, so I'm sure you guys have noticed it over the years. I got a lot of planes going over here. At this time of year, I think they are primarily looking for moonshine stills. Easier to spot at this time of year because there's no foliage yet. Uh, later in the year, they'll be looking for marijuana fields here in the forest. And that keeps them busy. So we always have, we always have quite a few planes flying over us because we're kind of we're in the woods over here. And when you get in the woods... A lot of secret stuff goes on. So, so that said, uh, as, as I was saying, when people think of pre-1899 guns, uh, cartridge guns, they tend to think of Colt Single Action Armies, thanks to Hollywood. I believe that's the only gun that was used. And, you know, those that are more informed will think of the other single actions around, like Remingtons and Smith & Wesson and Schofields and... Uh, new model number threes, Merwin Hulberts. But the fact of the matter is, they really didn't sell that much. Now, none of them did, compared to the Colt. And Colt did not sell nearly as many single actions uh, as were sold double action revolvers. The most popular guns of the late 19th century were double action revolvers. They're coming back again and they were they were used primarily for self-defense then and you know just like if it was good enough for Wild Bill Hickok in 1860 it's good enough for me now well believe me if it was good enough for John Wesley Harden in 1890 it should be good enough for you now too so for my money one of the smartest things you could do is to get an antique double action revolver they are as useful today as they ever were now if you do like the big bore firepower Colt Merwin Hulbert and Smith & Wesson all made 45 and 44 caliber versions of their double action revolvers uh, and I have Colts and Smith & Wessons and I'm going to tell you don't get Colts uh, because it's made just like the single action army, has no modern features, it's slow to load, slow to unload, got a horrible trigger. But the Smith & Wesson, which this is, is a marvelous double action revolver. It gives you almost the same ability that you would get if you had today's swing out cylinders, except this is a top rake. So you've got automatic ejection, if you get a speed loader that would handle 45 Colt, or even 44 Magnum, I think will work. Uh, 44 Magnum certainly will work, because most of these are in 44 Russian. Uh, this one's in 4440. But you can load it and unload it as fast as you can a modern revolver. 
and it's got a good double action trigger pull. It's well balanced. Uh, it's every bit as good for your purposes as picking up a modern end frame. Now it's as big as a modern end frame, so it's a big gun. Right? But if you feel that you need 44 caliber stopping power, well this is the gun that I recommend and it'll be excellent. Now, of course, that has all of the same foibles as, uh, as shooting those big 45 Colt guns in terms of you've got to be able to handle the recoil and you've got to be able to shoot large caliber as well. And this is not exactly a concealable gun, but you may not be concealing it anyway if you just want it for protecting your home, right? This is a good choice. Now, the downside of this is any of these guns, any of the big bore guns, are quite expensive. If you got any of the single action big bores from the 19th century, Colt, Merwin Hulbert, Smith & Wesson, Remington, you're looking at a couple of grand uh, as the walking in the door start to discuss it price. And the price goes up to there. It can be four or $5,000. That's probably not what you want to do. And, and that's understandable. Um, I got this gun quite a while ago for about $900. Quite happy with that price. I don't think you could touch it for that today. So, just on price, these may be out. And, and that, that's too bad, uh, because if you really want to stop a bad guy in his tracks, well, that Smith & Wesson, best way to do it. Number two would be the Merwin Hulbert uh, Pocket Army in 4440. Get the three and a half inch barreled one and uh, get the double action and you've got a gun with as smooth an action almost as, as a Colt today. Uh, its downside is though it unloads pretty quickly you can't use a speed loader to load it. Uh, the other downside is it'll cost you about four or five thousand dollars so that's that's kind of the sad news right there. So let's say that you don't want the expense of buying one of those big bore double action revolvers, quite understandable. And you also want something that's gonna be smaller, more portable, still do the job. Well, you've got a lot of choices, uh, a way lot of choices. In 1880, Smith & Wesson pioneered the top break double action 38 caliber revolver. And these, these are mostly in Smith & Wesson 38 Smith & Wesson caliber. This one is a model called the Lemon Squeezer because it has a grip safety. Uh, but they had a lot of them that did not and that actually had hammers. This is a safety hammerless model. Uh, one of the reasons I like this so much is because of the rear sights. Uh, most of the rear sights on these 19th century guns take a lot of getting used to. However, the rear sight on the Smith & Wesson is very good just as it is. It's got a very modern sight picture. It's excellent. Uh, Merwin Hulbert's also have a really good sight picture, by the way. So, this is a better sight picture than other Smith & Wesson uh, double action guns. But, these are top brakes. They're simultaneously ejecting. The beauty of these, the 38s, is that they are the same size They're the same size as a Smith & Wesson J-Frame revolver. Now this is actually a Taurus, not a Smith & Wesson. However, it's the same size. And so I'm gonna show you the holster that fits a J-Frame revolver. Will also fit these Smith & Wesson top brakes. Now, you can load this thing just as quickly as you can a modern revolver because the same speed loaders that fit that fit a J-frame will also fit the Smith & Wesson. So there you go. Ready to go. So you've got rapid unloading and rapid loading.
All right, let's put some rounds through the lemon squeezer. So, the real Smith & Wessons like this one, they're the most expensive. So they'll cost you probably $700 to $900 in good shape, but a lot of them are in good shape. And really, that's in the same neighborhood as you would spend for a modern Smith & Wesson. <clears throat> so, if you were not, uh, by necessity, trying to avoid government regulation, and you're going to buy a double action revolver to put in your coat pocket for your hour of need, you'd spend just as much on a modern J-frame as you would buying this lemon squeezer, as they call it, because of that. Uh, and you can find some of them for less. But if you want to save money, this is a Harrington and Richardson copy. It has no grip safety. It's called a safety hammerless. It is also in 38 Smith & Wesson, simultaneous ejecting top brake. Hammerless, no snag, very modern. Excellent action. It will also fit the J-frame holster. And as an added benefit, the, uh, the same speed loaders that you would use on a J-frame swing-out cylinder revolver will work on these, right? So you can unload simultaneously and reload simultaneously with speed loader just the way you can with a modern gun. So what are the advantages of, of these little guns? Well, quite simply, they're double action. Therefore, you can shoot them faster. They have very good actions. They're very well made. You can find a lot of these things in excellent condition. Uh, you'll find a lot of doggy ones, but if you look around, you can find really good ones. Because then, like now, these guns were most often bought for someone's hour of need. They were put in the sock drawer by the bed. That hour of need never came. So they were rarely fired, rarely taken out. And you'll find them just like this one in pristine shape, mechanically and cosmetically. All right, let's, uh, let's put a few rounds through the Harrington or Richardson. So you don't have to buy a doggy one. There are plenty of doggy ones out there, but you don't need to do that. You can get these for more like $400 which is pretty close to the same price range you would get to buy your cap and ball gun and a lot cheaper than buying a cap and ball gun and a cartridge conversion cylinder. And you get the benefit of a more concealable gun that'll fire double action, that's made to take cartridges, that can be loaded simultaneously and unloaded simultaneously, all with these guns. Uh, and, and I have to say that I think that this is absolutely the way to go and whether you use Smith & Wesson, Harrington & Richardson or Ivor Johnson you can't go wrong they're all good guns uh, now the Harrington & Richardson and the Ivor Johnson will generally speaking cost you much less than the actual Smith & Wessons and in most cases they'll be just as good so I recommend that you get those if, uh, if the dollars are a concern to you. You'll be in, in the same neighborhood you would have been for cap and ball for self-defense. Uh, if the dollars are not a concern, I would recommend you get Smith & Wesson because the build quality is a little bit better. Though I have to say, these Ivor Johnsons particularly, uh, they have wonderful build quality, every one I've looked at. And they have a good safety feature. These have a transfer bar safety. Uh, the others have a rebounding firing pin. Now, if 38 is not your cup of tea, these little guns also come in 32. They're the same features, top brake, simultaneous ejection. This is an Ivor Johnson 32. They're about as powerful as uh, 32 ACP, which not 
not what you want to bet your life on, but it's better than betting it on a pea shooter on a slingshot, right? So this is a gun that'll put a hole in somebody and make them leak, uh, or make them think twice because they don't want to have a hole in them. Which is really the situation you are most often going to encounter. Uh, but if somebody is breaking into your house, and they are not going to be deterred just by looking at a gun, uh, I would I would really recommend one of these 38s, which is more likely to convince them to stop their depredations. All right, so you've been watching me shoot these guns today. And you've probably noticed I'm shooting them with black powder cartridges. And, and that's because you're going to be, you're going to have very little chance of finding a pre-1899 gun that is proofed for smokeless. Now, the rounds that I'm shooting are black powder hand loads. Uh, you can't really buy black powder cartridges for these things. But you can buy smokeless cartridges. Now, I don't recommend that you make a, a uh, habit of shooting smokeless cartridges in these guns that are proofed for black powder cartridges. Nothing bad's gonna happen at first, uh, but eventually you're gonna loosen them up because the pressure, the bullet jump, all of that stuff is, is harder and faster with the smokeless powder ammo. It just as even the light, lightly loaded stuff, uh, it just burns faster than the black powder ammo does and at higher pressures, no, no matter what you do. So, I recommend that you do as much practicing with these as you should do with any firearm you're going to use to defend your life. And if you're going to do that, then I recommend that you use black powder reloads to do your practicing with. And it's easy enough to clean this stuff up, uh, but you'll have to clean it every time you shoot it. And you find doggy guns out there. There's two reasons for doggy guns. One is corrosive ammo, and that might even be smokeless because the primers on early smokeless ammo were all quite corrosive. So if you didn't clean the gun right away, it was gonna get rusty. You're gonna get a rusty bore, you're gonna have problems. And we see a lot of that. Uh, the other problem that I see for a lot of these is that they were probably shot with a diet of smokeless ammo, and that loosened them up. It loosens up the latches, it loosens up the hinge pin. Uh, it causes real problems to them. It's going to knock, eventually it's going to knock the timing off. So, what I recommend is that you buy smokeless ammo, and you keep that for your hour of need, because if you shoot five of those through this, or ten of them, you're not going to destroy the gun. And they are more peppy, and that will be noticed by your assailant on his end. So I recommend that you do that, but I recommend you practice with black powder hand loads and learn how to do that. Uh, and you're no worse off than loading cap and ball revolvers with black powder, for goodness sakes. Just get an inexpensive reloading press. I recommend a Lee turret loader. And Get some bullets, get some black powder, some primers, and reload your shells. It's not, it's not rocket science, and it's well worth it to be able to carry effective protection when you need it. So that is my recommendation to you. Well, let me just share some final thoughts with you, if, if I may. Uh, as I said earlier in the video, every human being has a basic right to self-defense. That right's not bestowed by governments. And I have to say, there are some countries in the world where they have attempted to take the right of self-defense away from people. And that results in some real problems because people end up getting arrested for defending their lives. And anyone is going to defend their life if it's in jeopardy. Any real man, or real woman for that matter, no one allows themselves to be killed if they can fight back. Even weak people fight back. 
because it's wired into us to stay alive, right? So legislating away that right of self-defense, that's just the height of stupidity. And really, to me, it's immoral, absolutely immoral, because people will defend themselves and they should be able to defend themselves. I don't believe that we should take away the rights of people to defend themselves, excuse me, because they made a mistake in their past. And if they pay the price for that, and they live their life right, well, I think they are allowed to exercise their basic human rights. So that's my view. And therefore, I have no problem with someone taking my advice and buying an antique double action revolver to defend their lives. Now, no one has the right to attack someone else, right? So if somebody takes my advice to do evil, well, they probably would have done evil anyway. But if a good person is able to resist that evil because of my advice, uh, then I think it's worth it. So that's why I did this video. I hope it was helpful to you. Uh, let me know in the comments. I'm sure, I'm sure you will. If you liked it, give me a thumbs up. If you didn't, I'm sure there's going to be people who won't. Thumb it down, that's fine. But, you know, either way, and particularly if you thumb it down, tell me why. Uh, I don't get many thumbs down. I, I have to say my videos are usually in the 99 plus percent range for likes versus dislikes, but I always get some. And I always wish people would tell me why, because if I know why, I can evaluate whether or not there's something that I can do better. Uh, I mean, I may just decide that your reason, uh, I don't agree with it. But you know, lots of times I have a pretty open mind about that stuff. I'll think about it, and if I think you're right, then I can make the video better. And make me better. So feel free. Let me know. But I love your comments. I try to respond to as many of them as I can. Uh, I've had, this time of year it gets a little bit harder because I'm going away to events quite a bit. And when I go away to an event, I'll back up a thousand emails easily. And I often can't get through them and still read the volume of new ones coming in, so I, I just have to just dump them. So I'm sorry. So if ever you write me and you don't get an answer, if it was something that required an answer, uh, by all means, write me again, and uh, I'll try to get back to you. So that's it for this week. I hope you enjoyed it. And until next week, bye.